thank you so much for the introduction. And also thank you so much for all the participants and join us during your lunch hour. Um, in front of the screen, I actually cannot see your faces, but um, greeting from home. Uh, I'm wondering what do you have for lunch? Um, for me, lunch is always a headache. What to eat for lunch is always a headache. But for my husband, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, he can have like prawn noodle for 15 years. So we, we're making decisions in our everyday life. Sometimes the decisions are very straightforward, are very simple and easy. We don't need even to think about it. Then we just make a decision in the real time manner. But sometimes we may face like difficult situations. The decisions are complex and complicated. We may need to search around. We may need to ask our opinion from the friends or ask our opinion uh, from our trust ones. So today I would like to introduce you artificial intelligence. Uh, so hopefully you can make friends with artificial intelligence to let artificial intelligence help you with decision making. Okay, let's start. So I would like to first uh, show you the three decision making scenarios uh, we're facing uh, in our daily life. Uh, let's say if you have an uh, artificial intelligence friend and you want your AI friends to help you make a decision. So the first scenario is, which driving route should I take to work today? I think it's pretty straightforward, right? So we trust the AI 100%. We're using uh, GPS and Google Map in our everyday life. So we don't need to think about it. So we trust the recommendation uh, given by Google or given by GPS or other, other app. And if we look at the second question, should I play golf on Sunday? So to play golf or not to play golf on Sunday, I think it pretty much depends on the weather condition. So we may look at artificial intelligence for weather forecasting, but we all know from our past experience, weather forecasting is based on probabilities. So the probability of raining or not raining. So is AI give us this information of weather forecasting, but it leads to us to make the decision and should we go out to play golf, even there's probability of raining, or should we go there and wait for the rain to stop and so on and so forth. And the third scenario you may face in your workplace, let's say your manager, uh, there's a job opening. There are many, many applicants than suitable candidates. So you select five of them, but you couldn't decide which one is the best candidate and which one you should hire. So in the, under this scenario, if artificial intelligence gives you some suggesting, perhaps you don't trust that 100% because as a manager, you have your past experience at the end, you have your common sense and expertise. Perhaps you want yourself to be the person to make the decision. So these three questions actually illustrate the three different scenarios under which artificial intelligence can help us to make a decision. So the first one, I call it decision automation. Machine and you work together hand in hand so you don't need to think about it, just trust it 100% to automate the decision-making process and to outsource our decision-making to machine learning, or artificial intelligence, or to technology, or GPS. And the second one, I would call it decision augmentation. So artificial intelligence, our technology may suggest something but you are the person will think about it, whether you want to accept that decision or not. And the third scenario, it is decision support. You are the person, you are the key decision maker, and you only look at the information or evidence or what kind of uh, automation outcome provided by artificial intelligence, but you are the key person making the decision, especially those important decisions 
in our life. Uh, I felt hands writing up, so we're going to handle questions uh, towards the end of the session. Uh, thank you for your understanding. So the first scenario, the machine plays the primary role. No minimal human involvement. We just make the decision based on, on the facts. Let's say if you work in the banking sector, if you want to calculate uh, the customer's uh, credit scoring, of course, the machine has much power to do calculation, to process the data, to give you more reliable output than a human being, than your manual process. And also if you're a HR manager, perhaps it is easier for you to use this artificial intelligence and automation, the predictive outcome to predict that aptitude test uh, results. Okay, let me just stop here because I saw some questions. Uh, so what's the problem? Okay, please feel free to ask during the, uh, towards the end of the session. Yeah, I saw your hands, Elizabeth and the Liwa. Okay, so let's, uh, let's carry on. The, the second scenario, that decision, augmentation, so you and machine still work together. The machine suggests you decide or you decide, then let the machine give you some ideas. Let's say, for example, if you're working in a marketing department, you may need to use machine learning to look at your customer performing if you want to launch a target marketing campaign because you want to know what are the customer segments you want to target at, you want to save your budget, you want to set up your target marketing strategy. And in this case, if you have a large customer base, it is not possible for you to figure out how many customer segments among your customers. So you may need to use machine learning, the data mining approach to look at the data to see what are the segments, what are the clusters, uh, what is the performing of your customer. So machine is going to provide that information to you, but you are the person as a marketing manager to set up your target marketing strategy. The machine is not going to do your job. Your machine has no idea what kind of marketing strategy is the best suitable is for your target customer group. And the last one, so those important decision scenarios. So we use artificial intelligence as a support to support us with evidence, to support us with historical record. So if you're following the news of ChatGTP, uh, you may have heard there's a recent case, a lawyer that used all the cases uh, suggested by ChatGTP. And unfortunately, those cases are not real cases, are fake cases are made up by uh, ChatGTP. So as a lawyer, if you're working in the legal department or as a judge, so you still, we have to use our professional knowledge to make the decision. So we need to evaluate the facts, the data information provided by artificial intelligence, such as chat GPT. So in short, these are the three decision scenarios we may need to leverage artificial intelligence. So the first, automation. The second, augmentation. And the third is decision support. So before we using artificial intelligence, I think we need to get it clear. So why the decision scenarios we are facing? So it's not necessarily every decision, doesn't matter if it's in your everyday life, your at your workplace should be automated. So we have to work with artificial intelligence together to make the decision. So the good news is ChatGPT is not going to take away your job. Uh, the biggest news in this field this year is, of course, is ChatGTP. And I believe everyone uh, you have been trying out ChatGPT. So you, you look at the adoption curve of ChatGPT, it's almost vertical. So barely more than two months, it's reached like 10 million users in history. So this is number one. This is number one. So at first, as a normal person, our reaction perhaps is pretty similar. 
to what I'm showing on the screen. You're pretty happy. Yeah, the chat GPT can help me to write emails, can help me to write reports, or help me to uh, prepare PPT slides. But after you give it a second thought, perhaps you become a little bit worried. Mm. If chat GPT can take away my work, mm, can I still, you know, get a well-paid job? So hopefully right now you have certain level of assurance uh, that artificial intelligence is not going to do decision-making automation 100%. So if we are looking back at our history, if we look back at every industrial revolution, they actually, the outcome of every industrial revolution is creating more jobs rather than taking jobs away. Of course, they're creating eighteen more jobs uh, uh, different domains. And so after this talk, hopefully you become a happy person like me, can happily working with artificial intelligence together in your daily life. <laughs> Okay, uh, so younger version of me and my better half. So, after share with you the three different scenarios, I would like to touch a little bit of the, the technical aspect. So if you're not working in the domain of like data science and machine learning, you may be wondering, so how does this data science machine learning or in short artificial intelligence enable decision-making process for us? It's quite complicated. It is a big domain, but today I will just want to share with you the process and the very popular algorithms. So the process is very straightforward. Three steps. First, I call it input. So data just like a, uh, is the input of your decision making. So similar to our human decision making, artificial intelligence also need to take in the input, for example, the data. Of course, the data takes like different forms. You have structured, unstructured, you have like machine generated data or human generated data. So that's the first step is data acquisition. So artificial intelligence is using the sensory system to gather data, the visual data, the image data, and your web log data, and those like numerical values, so all sort of data. But data in the real world is a large amount of data, so we call it big data, and data in the real world is pretty messy, also it's very dirty, and data itself has no value. So because of that, and artificial intelligence need to do some sense making to process data in order to clean the data, to pre-process the data, to structure the data, to slice and dice the data, to learn the underlying patterns from the data, to extract key information from data. So this process, it is sense making. So through machine learning algorithms, through deep learning to other search algorithms. So the last process, which is number three, I call it make sense. Make sense as human beings, as human intelligence, we actually own the number three step because we are the one to make sense from the models, to make sense from this automation output. So we make sense to make a decision on top of the information to proceed with our business actions. So the three steps, input, process, and output. I think for input and output are pretty straightforward. Although this input is very much time consuming. Um, just now I mentioned in the real world, you have vast amount of data and it is messy. So we need to pre-process the data. So it is time consuming. But towards the end, the most challenging step is actually the final one. So how to make sense from the information, how to make sense from the modeling output. So later we're going to discuss that. So now let me just 
talk an example of how artificial intelligence is processing the data, is doing sense making. I would like to share with you the most popular algorithms. It's called decision tree. And behind decision tree is an algorithm called ID3. So in industry, we call this algorithm the most valuable algorithm. So why this algorithm, it is so valuable, it is so expensive, because this algorithm have the financial sector, especially the banking institutions, to decide fraudulent transactions like money laundry cases. You know, something to deal with money. So that's why it is very valuable. So I'm sharing with you on the screen is a toy example. So in this toy example, you can see there are 15 customers. So we have a customer ID, one column. So this is how we prepare the data in a tidy way. And besides customer ID, we have number of features or variables or target. So in this case, we have one particular target we try to predict. We call it outcome. So whether the credit card customer is going to pay his or her credit card bills or not. So it's a toy data set of a credit card customer. And we also know the information of the customer's age and whether the customer has a job or not, and the customer's house ownership and the customer's credit rating. So with that information, we can just give the data to machine learning algorithms. The machine learning algorithms is going to do some magic within seconds, give us some output. Okay, let's take a look at this output. So this is output. So following the machine learning process, it used decision tree modeling. It's going to give us a visualization. So this visualization is a viewer of the decision tree. So on top, you see one of the customer variable is called age. So we have three age group, young customer, middle-aged customer, and old customer. And at the secondary level, you see the customer's house ownership, employee status, and credit rating, and the credit rating. So which means if we read this tree structure, so which means age, it's a number one decision factor in order to decide or in order to predict a customer is going to pay credit card bill or not. So the machine learning algorithm put age on top as a root node, exactly like a tree. It's a root of the tree is the most important part, right? So it's a root node, it is an age. So following age, we have secondary considerations. Let's say, for example, for old customers, credit card rating is critical. For middle-aged customers, house ownership is critical. For young customers, employment status is the most important. So this is what can be produced by a machine learning algorithm within seconds after you input the data, so this is how it processes the data. But what is the output? So what? Let's say, for example, right now you have a new customer. So this new customer is a middle-aged customer. And this new customer living in a rental flat does not own a HTV flat. And the machine learning algorithm can automatically predict whether you know, this customer will pay the credit card bill or not. So let's just following this tree structure. So if you take a look, age, and this is middle. So how soon the shift it is true? Yes, the customer is going to pay credit card bill, but it's false. So it's very unlikely for this customer to pay the credit card bill. So because to, of this automation, the managers at the credit card department can make a decision in the real-time manner. Should they give the credit card? Should they approve the credit card application for the customer or not? So this is how it works. So starts with input. 
data, very tidy data set. We have target to predict, and also we have features, we have inf data to predict that target. And during the process stage, we have this tree structure clearly visualized, clearly shows us. So what is the decision making process? And towards the output stage, we can automatically decide whether we should approve the customer's credit card application or not. So this just use a toy example in the banking sector to share with you the most popular or also most valuable uh, this, uh, decision tree modeling. Next. So can we apply this approach in other domain? I'm not working in a bank. I'm not a credit card department manager. So I'm an HR manager or I'm a marketing manager. Perhaps I want to predict about my customer chain. Maybe as an HR manager, I want to predict my employee attrition because employee attrition is the biggest problem faced by the HR department. So you want to retain good people, right? You want your employee to stay with your company, to contribute uh, to your company and to Im improve their lifetime value. So let's say you have a data set and from your historical data, this HR department owns everything, knows everything about the employee, the age, the job grade, the salary and the family status and so on and so forth. So these are the data acquisition stage. So you have all the data. And from your historical data, then you also know which person has resigned, which person has left the company. So we can predict that as a target. So attrition, one equals to yes, no equals to zero. Okay, we just give that low, the attrition, uh, all the information, all the data to the similar machine learning algorithm. Uh, just now they did a good job for uh, uh, credit card. Uh, defect uh, fraud detection. So this is the modeling output produced by the machine learning process. So it gives you the list of decision factors. So people are more likely to quit. Mm. They work longer hours. They have to travel long distance from home. They're single. They don't have any so-called like uh, family commitments and their job is sales. You know, salespeople, they're more, more flexible. They work over time. They recently promoted, they get a better pay. They maybe have high bargaining power with a new employer and they have been work at multiple companies. So these are the possible reasons will trigger a person to leave the company. So why the reasons you know, those people may tend to stay with the company. So those are people who stay longer with the current manager. That implies this person may have a very good working relationship with uh, his or her direct line manager. A good working relationship is important. And stay longer in the company, in the current role, and low job involvement, you know, the pay is all right, but not much work, right? Low job involvement. I know over time, salary is higher. And education level also not very high. So this is from the actual data set from the company called IBM. Uh, uh, the comp IBM. So IBM have 1,500 employees. So they use the employee data set. Then we can generate a modeling output like this. So we can apply this modeling output in our HR decision-making process. So right now, you may have a very good employee, a very good uh, person, a very good fellow in your sales, sales department, and her name is Elizabeth. So we know the information about Elizabeth, uh, 41 years old and single, uh, his job title, his education background, and his business travel frequency. So we can just input all the data, all the information of Elizabeth to the previous model we built on top of our historical record. Then within a second, we're going to get this output. Then the algorithm is going to suggest 
based on the information inputs, this person, Miss Elizabeth, has like 60% chances of leaving your company. So if you think it's a valuable employee and you want to keep her, then you better do something, stop her from leaving the company. So this is how machine learning and using their most popular modeling, decision tree modeling. So help us to do prediction, to do prediction. So the cases I'm sharing right now, uh, is not only uh, the practice by industry, but actually uh, it's been practiced by our government sector. So next two cases, um, uh, the projects uh, uh, NUS has been involved uh, together with our public sector. So uh, let's see how they use uh, machine learning algorithm and different intelligence to make Singapore a better place. First one, patients no show prediction. If you have appointments with KK Hospital, our Singapore General Hospital, probably as a, as a good patient or good, I mean, good person, uh, you may stick to your appointment. But, you know, we can't predict because appointment perhaps is uh, uh, three months away or six months away. We may not able to predict what is happening on the exact day. We may not show up for the appointment. So if there's sufficient proportion or sufficient amount of patients, they don't show up for the appointment. We all know the medical resources in Singapore is so expensive and we do not want to create a longer queue for other patients. I think it is pretty critical. We want to do this project is called Patients No-Show Prediction. We look at existing data. The patient's no-show prediction rate is pretty high. Sorry, I'm not able to re release the actual information, but it's a two-digit number. It's a two-digit number. The patient's no-show rate. So as a public sector, especially public hospitals, so they own the data of the patients, so personal information, demographic information, so on and so forth. And also we know the patient's medical history. Then we also know the patient's... Um, uh, uh, experience uh, with the hospital, let's say for example, uh, whether the patient has showed up for uh, his previous appointment or not, and how long was the waiting time. And we, uh, meanwhile, we know uh, what's the patient's situation. Is it very serious? Is it you know, just mild, just something ongoing? And we also know the patient's age. So based on the data, so we feature out about like 17 features, 17 attributes will contribute to patients' no-show. So some of the attributes are pretty interesting. Let's say, for example, one of them is a demographic factor, it's the age. So usually for those elderly patients, perhaps, you know, uh, they're, they're less busier. So they tend to show for their medical appointments. And also there's a feature, is something to do with the ranking of the, house, uh, of the doctor. So let's say if the doctor is a senior consultant, oh, the patients will go there to see the senior consultant. But of course, if the situation is more serious, uh, they tend to show that for their uh, appointment. So based on the historical data, so the model accuracy level is, is pretty high. You look at 77%, mm, you may think about this, 77%, why not 100%? Um, sorry, guys. Uh, artificial intelligence never been 100% accurate. So 77% if something to do with social research with human subject is a very good accuracy level already. So with that, and then the public hospitals can manage their booking, can manage their booking. All right, so this is the first example I would like to share with you. Then for this project, then they use similar algorithms like decision tree to do a classification modeling. So next is a text mining project. So input of the data, uh, just now I mentioned, uh, it takes like different forms. So you have image data, video data, or text data. And in this project with uh, Housing Development Board, HDB, then they use text data. 
because HDB is handling a lot of emails and inquiries from our HDB residents. So it is quite crucial for HDB to extract what the key information from those inquiries to identify bottleneck of their service. So through this data mining exercise, so through their like inquiries, uh, emails, so they identify um, one of the example things they published that I think um, I can feel free to share this example is about key collection. So when your HTTP flat is ready after a number of years, uh, then the government uh, will set a date, set an appointment with you and then ask you to collect your key. But as a young couple, you have been waiting like three or five years for your new flat. Perhaps you don't wait, do not want to wait any longer. So you may want to reschedule it to an early date to start renovation. But for older couples that may downgrade from five room flat to a three room flat, they may not able to get a mortgage in time. They may not get a bank loan in time, so they may want to postpone this key collection date. It used to be all these changing of appointments, you have to go through HDB service officers. So because of this information extra extraction, the HDB identify this key collection and changing of key collection date is a bottleneck of the service, then they automate it. They migrate it from menu to digital. So right now, if you want to change the key collection date, you can just log in to the website and change your date yourself. So this one of the good things, we're pretty happy of the, with this project. All right, how to start, how to start. Perhaps by now you're kind of inspired by, um, using machine learning or artificial intelligence uh, to do something. I think first, as a working professional, if we want to start it, we need a clear defined business problem. Uh, we, we don't start with data, but data messy, dirty, data list is nowhere. And we look for whether the data is available. And of course, most important, we have to look at whether we have this capability, we have this knowledge, to solve this problem. So later I'm going to share with you some um, courses uh, run by uh, School of Computing. Uh, so you may take a look. So those for uh, working professionals may equip you with the knowledge and skill uh, to apply machine learning uh, technology. So this is my last slice. Uh, I just want you to give this to you as a takeaway, um, something to think about it. Machine learning algorithm or artificial intelligence, um, they're using data to process data to make a decision. But what if there's no data? Say if you want to make something for your innovation decision, there's no data could artificial intelligence used in innovation decision making. I leave it to you to think about it. I leave it to you to think about it. If there's no data, how do you make decisions? And the last one uh, is our commercial break. Um, I, I really like this um, uh, photo. I, I got it from a British Museum. Uh, so if you uh, visited British Museum, perhaps you can recognize uh, the picture. So this is a picture of Rosetta Stone. So because the discovery of this Rosetta Stone, there are three different languages on this piece of stone. So you have like Egyptian uh, writing formats, then you have ancient Greek. So the scholars, they're able to understand ancient Egyptian language. They're able to explore the great um, ancient Egyptian uh, civilization. So from my past experience over 10 years, uh, working in the data domain, working with uh, public sectors, private sectors, and training like thousands working professionals. So I really found uh, that real data stone between data and the business is missing. So data person don't understand your business and business person not quite sure how to unlock the power of data using uh, uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence. So right now, we're kind of providing the Rosetta Stone for you. So we have uh, online courses. Uh, if you're 
very busy, so you can take it anytime, uh, anywhere. And also, we have coming up offline courses. This is for uh, digital transformation. So I will like to stop now.